Okay, thank you. Um, so we just heard a couple of fun cases from Calvin, um, but I'm gonna ask the question here today, do we really need to operate on these patients? Um, so as, as we know, uh, vesicovaginal fistula is a connection between the bladder and the vagina. And if we look worldwide, obstetric fistula are most common. That results from obstet um, obstructed labor. And you get something similar to what you see in this picture where you get a fistula more distal in the vagina. It can incorporate um, the bladder, neck, or even proximal urethra. There are an estimated 2 million women in sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia who are living with untreated or un detected vesicovaginal fistula, but it's obviously much more rare uh, in the U.S. and other industrialized countries, and the type of fistula that we see are uh, more akin to the type that Calvin described in his cases, uh, which are post-surgical or iatrogenic, so primarily from pelvic surgery or other oncologic treatments, and you get something more similar to this photo, where you get a fistula more proximal in the vagina towards the apex. Most commonly implicated is a benign hysterectomy. Um, it accounts for about two-thirds to three-fourths of the vesicovaginal fistula that we see here. And then you get a smaller proportion from other pelvic surgeries, obstetric trauma, meaning cesarean section, forceps delivery, uh, malignancy, and radiation. Um, Calvin already talked a little bit about this, but uh, benign hysterectomy has about a 1% risk of bladder injury, depending on what study you look at. Uh, and most urinary tract injuries are not going to result in fistula. So only about 10% of those cases are going to actually fistulize. So the overall risk of a fistula is very low. It's about one in a thousand. But you have to remember that we do almost a half a million hysterectomies in the United States each year. So while the absolute risk is really low, just because of the sheer volume of hysterectomies that are performed, it is something that we see. Uh, and as Calvin mentioned, the risk is much higher if you do a laparoscopic hysterectomy compared to um, open or vaginal or even subtotal. And it was previously thought that inter, uh, altered intra-abdominal anatomy, like endometriosis or um, prior surgery led to increased risk, but that actually hasn't really panned out in recent cohort studies. The degree of bladder injury matters. However, of course, you're more likely to get a fistula if you have a full thickness a bladder injury versus, you know, a bladder contusion. Um, patients present with leakage of urine through the vagina. It's rarely painful. If it's after surgery, it typically happens around one to three weeks after surgery. Uh, if it's from radiation, uh, then of course that's going to happen at a later time point on the order of months to years. And most can just be diagnosed with a speculum exam, like something similar to what you see in this picture, um, where you can see either a fistulous tract or prolapsing bladder mucosa at the vaginal apex. You can do vaginoscopy with a cystoscope if you need, um, and cystoscopy can support the diagnosis. If it's a new fistula, you might just see bolus edema. And if it's a um, more, uh, if injury happened uh, much earlier, then you might see a well-formed um, ostea. And uh, again, we already mentioned this, but of course you have to rule out upper tract injury as soon as you diagnose your vesicovaginal fistula because you get a concurrent ureterovaginal fistula in about 10% of cases. And if you have the patient in clinic and they have leakage, um, you can do a simple double dye test. So that's when you place methylene blue into the bladder and then you give the patient phenazopyridine and then you pack the vagina either with packing or a tampon. And when you take it out, if the, the packing is blue, then the fistula is to the bladder. If it's orange, it's to the ureter. If it's both, they may have both. Um, you can also send the fluid for creatinine. For example, if you're trying to figure out if the patient's just having some post-op serous drainage for the cuff uh, versus urine, um, remembering that if it is positive for creatinine, you still have to figure out if it's coming from the bladder or the ureter. And then, of course, you can perform imaging if needed, like a cystogram or a VCUG, if there's uncertainty and you can't, um, you're can't, you not seeing well on exam. Um, but like we mentioned in that previous case, the reason Dr. Commodore had gotten imaging on that other patient was really to look at the ureter because you can, like we said, kind of diagnose um, the fistula on exam a lot of the time. Okay, so now we've diagnosed our fistula. Do we need to operate? First, we have to ask ourselves, is there a chance that this just closes? And as you can imagine, unlikely. Um, it's been reported in individual case reports and Dr. Commodore recently had a patient who this just happened to uh, while, while she was waiting for her surgery. 
Um, but you really need unobstructed outflow of the urine before that tract epithelializes in order for the fistula to close. And so sphincter mechanisms in the bladder make that very unusual, although, of course, it's been reported. So in order to achieve the unobstructed outflow in the bladder, we use a catheter plus an anticholinergic to prevent bladder spasm, again, so that all of the urine is going out the catheter and nothing's going out the fistula. Um, will it close with the catheter? Uh, and before I go over this, you just have, we have to realize the quality of the data for this type of condition is generally poor because you're just relying on case series. Um, the International Consultation on Incontinence looked at all of the studies in the last almost 100 years and only had 12 relevant studies or case series on this matter. And uh, many of them included just one patient. And most of the patients came from a single surgeon in a single center in England. Um, but it is what we have. And of these 12 studies, they looked at using catheter uh, in widely variable uh, patient population. Um, and of the 348 patients, 45 had closure with catheter alone, which was a total of 13% with a very wide um, competence interval. Uh, interestingly, not we don't tend to see this here, but it's better studied in obstetric fistula. And there are some reports that um, you can get closure rates as high as 30% uh, in early catheterization for obstetric fistula. Uh, based on the data that we do have and expert consensus, it's generally thought that catheterization is going to be more successful if the fistula is small. So depending on where you look, less than three to five millimeters, or if the injury is recent. So before that tract has really had time to mature. Um, although it can happen for other fistula. This is a case report of a patient who had a vesicovaginal fistula after a LEAP procedure and had about a centimeter um, fistula. You can see all the necrotic tissue and the bladder in the photo here, and it healed with catheterization alone uh, because the catheter was placed pretty much right almost immediately the next day after the procedure. Um, if you put a catheter in and the patient is still having leakage out the fistula, then it's very unlikely to resolve um, the, the fistula because you still have urine going through it um, and it's not going to have a chance to heal. If you place a catheter and it's diverting all the urine, then you want to give it a trial of at least three weeks to see if it might work. Uh, people have come up with some ideas to see if we could make catheterization more successful, like fulgurating the fistula. Um, the idea is that you disrupt any epithelialization that's occurred around the fistula, and then the new scar can seal the communication between the bladder and the vagina. Um, it was initially described with a bug bee, and you do have to cauterize both the bladder and vagina. Um, and in the largest case series on this, they were able to achieve closure in patients with small fistula, less than five millimeters and 11 of 15 who had um, cautery. And the reason this was used is because they were further out from their injury, about 12 weeks. And so that fistula had some chance to mature already. And so just placing a catheter wasn't going to work. And so they um, fulgurated instead. Because we're ur urologists, we've also tried this with laser. Um, laser is a bit more precise, so it's just confined uh, its energy to the epithelium. And again, you have to laser both the vagina and the bladder, or if you laser the bladder, then you can just close the vagina separately. And again, in the, larger case the largest case series on this, which is only eight patients with a very small fistula, so on the order of two to four millimeters, they were able to achieve success in seven of those. Um, it is important to note that if a patient has a really thin septum between their vagina and their bladder and you start fulgurating, you do have the potential to open up the fistula and make it worse. Um, so it's better suited for somebody who has more robust tissue between the bladder and the, and the vagina. Um, fibrin sealants have also been, been, uh, used or tried for all sorts of urinary fistula. The one that I think we're all probably most familiar with is Tisiel. Uh, which was approved by the FDA to use in the 19 uh, in the U.S. in 1998, um, although it was used in Europe in the 1970s in surgery, um, much much before we used it here, and uh, we use it in urology for hemostasis, urinary tract sealing as a tissue adhesive for grafts. Um, the way it works is you have uh, two uh, separate chambers, one with thrombin and one with concentrated fibrinogen. And then when you apply it, um, you get immediate conversion of that fibrinogen to fibrin. It forms a fibrin clot. Uh, 
uh, and that kind of mimics the end of the coagulation cascade. There is reported success for other types of urinary fistula, for vesicocutaneous or urethrocutaneous fistula, but I can find one reported success in the literature for a vesicovaginal fistula. Um, and uh, it's thought that it's just better suited for a long, narrow fistula. Uh, the only time it was, or the only report of this working in a vesicovaginal fistula is a case where the patient couldn't undergo surgery. And so they bolstered the fistula with injections of collagen as well to try to hold that sealant in place. Um, although it can be used as an augment to repair a bladder injury in hopes of preventing fistula in the future. So the best thing is to prevent fistula formation in the first place. So we talked a little bit about detection of urinary injury um, intraoperatively. If you're called to perform um, uh, repair of a bladder injury, of course, you want to make sure you're um, obtaining a watertight closure. Consider extravesical drain placement. You want to avoid overlapping suture lines. So um, specifically in the vagina and the bladder. Uh, so if they have a big bladder injury and the uterus hasn't been taken yet, consider just aborting the hysterectomy to avoid those overlapping suture lines. And then you can consider a sealant or a flap, like an omental flap shown here, um, or a peritoneal flap, whatever is most easily available to you at the time, and then make sure you have prolonged post-op bladder drainage. So if we look at Campbell's, um, once you've diagnosed your vesicovaginal fistula, you can perhaps avoid operating. If the fistula is uncomplicated, it's small, um, you can try catheter plus or minus fulguration. So catheter only if the injury was recent, you can fulgurate if it's more epithelialized. Um, and then uh, additional uh, reasons to consider conservative management or if you're planning for a repair, uh, perhaps catheterize the patient in the meantime, and maybe it'll heal uh, while you're waiting for surgery. Or perhaps you repaired a vesicovaginal fistula and you had an early repair failure and you don't want to rush back to the operating room, you can try a catheter in the meantime. <laughs> Consider fulgurating again if the tract is epithelialized. And then move to surgery if when you put the Foley in, the urine's not diverted or the tract continues to stay open after prolonged urinary drainage. And this is the case that Calvin presented that we did um, in, uh, in September. Operating on them is more fun anyways. <laughs> That's all. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been how often do you see a patient with a fistula come into your clinic with a catheter versus without a catheter? In our clinic here, every patient has been without a catheter. Without? I believe, yeah, none of the patients we've seen in clinic have come in with a catheter. Okay, I mean, many come with a catheter mm -hmm. so in that sense, and, and they've all presented to their original surgeon, and then they get a catheter. So really, they all do get conservative management. And it's, it's not crazy. This is the first time I've ever seen spontaneous healing, but probably only done 50 of these, so I'm at 2% spontaneously healed. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Gallo. Right.